This week on FX Guide TV. We celebrate the enormous achievement of 40 years of industrial light and magic. And also look at the new term, fxphd.com. This and more coming up next. Hello, I'm Angie, and welcome to FX Guide TV. We have a very special FX Guide TV for you this week. I'm extremely proud to present to you our special tribute to 40 years of industrial light and magic. We were granted unprecedented access to bring you this special report on one of the world's greatest effects companies and the artists who wrote the book on visual effects in the modern age. Well, thanks so much for joining us, we really appreciate it. Now, I heard a rumour that years ago when I was a Parallax user, if I'd called service and support line, <laughs> it might have been you that actually answered the phone. Is that true? <laughs> it is true, it is true, especially if it had been in the wee hours of the night in, in uh, London time. Which is exactly when I would have been calling you from yeah, Australia. Yeah, yes. When yes. Parallax was the go-to solution for all things paint. This is true. This yes. is true. It's how I first got to work with ILM, by being on the other end of that support line. As soon as I got into the industry, I knew of, of ILM. So at that time, it was um, very early 90s, so Terminator, and then it really um, hit the big time. Even my mum knew about ILM when Jurassic Park came out. I got a sort of unauthorized, well, semi-authorized tour of ILM in May of 1978. How old are you? 15. Okay. So I spent the whole day at ILM. Uh, they were working on the original Battlestar Galactica TV show. So I went to dailies in the morning, uh, watched them building models in the model shop, got onto the motion control stage where they were shooting them. Uh, you know, I got the whole tour um, and hung out with, with everybody that day. Wow. And that was a life-changing experience. You can imagine that uh, it's one thing to read about these things in a magazine, but it's another thing to witness this in person, to see these are, these are real human beings, they, you know, they have their jobs, they come in in the morning, they build spaceships, they shoot them, they put the comps together, they work out what's wrong with them and fix it, and at that point you can kind of picture, I can fit in, I can be one of these guys. I, I, I'm astounded that, uh, that I got that wonderful opportunity to do it, but uh, it's pretty directly responsible for why I'm at ILM now. When did you join ILM? In 94. So um, uh, uh, after The Abyss came out, I ended up getting a job at Moving Picture Company. One of the other artists there, it was like the CG department was three people, basically. There was a big Harry department, and that, that's a compositing tool that they used to use back then. I was sort of hired because I could program this um, uh, Quantel box, which would do sort of it would map graphics onto bits of geometry to make interesting patterns and shapes and that sort of thing. Donuts. And donuts, exactly. So, um, so one of the other artists, one of the other three artists there was um, a guy named Jeff Campbell and he taught me Maya, oh, Alias 1.0 actually, and then Alias 242. And he left to come to ILM to do um, Terminator uh, 2. And so I was like, wow, that's great if you need someone to, you know, carry discs around or something, give me a yell. And then went to um, SIGGRAPH the year Jurassic Park came out. ILM had this blowout party and I ran into this guy, Jeff, and he's like, oh, ILM's recruiting. You should uh, send a reel over. And so I sent a reel over and they rang me and I think it was Australia Day, 94, and said, hey, uh, you know, do you want to, you know, they interviewed me. It was like a weird, sort of somewhat intimidating in retrospect interview panel. And then rang me back and said, we want to hire you. A, a friend of mine that I knew from uh, UCLA Film School gave me a call. He was working on this film that he wanted me to see what they were doing. And I was working in Canoga Park, which is not too far from Van Nuys. And I was working on a, a cheap sci-fi film myself where I had to crawl on the ground and control motors for the XYZ axis of, of, the, uh, of the flight of the spaceship or the whatever it was to fly at a camera or back. And it was, it was a terrible way to try and run a move. 
and because uh, you didn't know what you got till the next day. You soup the film and get it back from the lab and you go, oh, got to do it again. <laughs> so I go see my friend Dave. So he's, he, he's at this place. They don't know the name. It will be Star Wars. I walk in and he introduces me to several people. I remember Dennis Murin because I talked to him for a while and some others, I think Ken Ralston, and uh, to this day friends, of, of, and that was a long time ago, but uh, I was blown away because I saw the Dijkstra Flex, which is a very famous apparatus. It's the first track camera. I went, ah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to, literally, it was like a bolt of lightning from the sky, and I said, this is so brilliant. So I talked to Dennis. Uh, they were all filled up there, no more employment. But he said, there are a couple of movies starting. Uh, call this fella, G Greg Jean, he's doing 1941, they're just starting. And call uh, Bob Abel, they're, they're gonna do Star Trek, the motion picture. I called both of them up. Star Trek was starting first. I ran right over there and I got a job. So I've got to tell, I haven't told this to anybody other than friends once. A very curious thing. Uh, I called up my girlfriend who has, became my wife. Uh, LA again, Avco Embassy was where Star Wars was playing. And uh, for whatever, I think I was freelancing, so I, I was there in the afternoon and I went in to see if there were seats, because they were really filling up when it first came out. And I go across the street, Wilshire Boulevard, to Norm's, which is a famous old place where you'd get breakfast all day long, and there's a bank of uh, payphones. And I get, I get there waiting to use the payphone. There's William Shatner on the phone calling somebody saying, that's right, the film is amazing, I just saw it. This means something to the effect of, we can, we can now put Star Trek out as a motion picture. Now, I heard that phone call right then and there, and lo and behold, I would later on work on, or I did work on uh, Star Trek, the motion picture. So it was a weird thing of all these things coming together at the same wow. time. What truly amazed me when I joined ILM was the model, surprisingly. So it's not, it's nothing like really technological, but seeing like the model out there in the model shop, you know, was like truly amazing to me. Like coming from like, you know, the more like, you know, computer graphic world. I, I remember like on first year I was here, I um, walked out of, uh, between like the two buildings where ILM was and saw the Black Pearl, which was like, it was pretty big. It was maybe like 30 feet long. And uh, they were just rolling it into like the sound stage, you know, like where they had put like a, a water tank there. And so that, that was really true. the old Kerner optical That's location. the old, old yeah. Kerner optical. And that was really, truly amazing to me, like seeing all the, the props. I was going to school at San Francisco State and we had a model maker from the model shop come in. And he, uh, um, he taught us how to build things and at that time I was always making models and I was really, I was like, I gotta be a modeler. <laughs> and he invited all of us up to um, Kerner, uh, the model shop, and, um, and showed us around and, and that was sort of the start of, you know, wow, this is where it happens and how can I be a part of it and I want to make models. Like, I just love making things with my hands. And then somehow it turned into computer graphics <laughs> at some point. So I got hired at ILM uh, in camera department, um, but I was really intrigued with computer graphics. I'd been you know, reading about it, but I'd never worked at a place that had a computer graphics department. You know, I'd worked at all these places that were model shop and stage and optical printer places. So um, I went over and got a, a tour of the computer graphics department, and I remember. Um, this was in early 1986, and uh, they, they were just, uh, uh, ILM had just uh, started working on Howard the Duck, and went over to the computer graphics department, and I saw a demonstration that uh, work that they were, was, were in progress on was digital wire removal on some shots in Howard the Duck. Uh, so there was a shot with, uh, in the duck world where uh, uh, Howard's in an easy chair and kind of smashes through an apartment building. And the chair was, uh, was on a wire rig that was dragged through the set and you could see the wires. I think they'd made some attempt to, to, uh, to hide them, but nope, they showed up and uh, everything else was great about the take and uh, nobody could figure out how, how to get rid of the wires otherwise. And uh, the thought was, well, we can use this new digital optical printer. 
They'll scan the stuff in, and then there was a program called Layer Paint that had digital paint program that could work on full high resolution frames, and you could paint the wires out uh, from using a different frame or a clean pass. And they were in progress on that, and I was super impressed by what I saw. That was spring of 86. When you come to a, a, a company like this, that um, in terms of computer graphics, actually, they have some super talented people. I mean, you know, um, Doug Smythe, who, you know, was one of the first people I worked with here. He'd, um, and I've worked with ever since. And um, he'd sort of developed the code behind the early morph stuff. John Knoll had been involved in Photoshop and obviously digital compositing was a huge innovation that really Jurassic brought forward. Well, I was surprised too with Jurassic that it, uh, it's held up as well as it has. I thought when we were over with it, first of all, everything, everything I work on, when I'm done with it, I try to imagine being obsolete because I just don't want to repeat it over and over again. And then you've got to, and I make, it, I figure the audience is the same way. They want to see something different. So you have to figure out, okay, what is next? Because there's nowhere to look. But Jurassic has held up, and I don't think it really, even though I worked on Lost World, I don't think it made the first one obsolete. Uh, the Pixar image computer blew my mind. Uh, uh, and I, I also like to tell a, a story of of a demo I got at the Pixar, where uh, someone loaded up a, an image into the high resolution frame buffer of the, the Pixar and sharpened it. And I remember being really impressed by that, not because, oh wow, you can sharpen an image, it was that my mind raced ahead to what that implied. That if you could take a piece of film and you could turn it into numbers, and you could take those numbers and you could manipulate them on a computer workstation and then put them back out onto film when you were done, that meant that there was literally no limit to what you could do to the images in the meantime. There's so many things that we can do these days that come from a basis back then. There are a lot of technological breakthroughs all, all the way along that got us to where we are now. Something as simple as Maya animation, where every animator uses it to, to make movement, whether it's a spaceship or a character, you know, you know, moving their arm, hinge joints, ball joints, all the rest of it. That all comes from spline curves. All the spline curves, that's just literally graphable speeds, fast and slow over time, that were the same as what we used on the motion control camera systems. When I got there, enveloping and skinning, of course, was sort of something ILM did uniquely well. Um, one of my first projects at ILM was Twister, where we kind of really push particle systems along quite a lot. And so um, I think facial animation tools were a big thing on Dragonheart. We did facial animation tools for the dragon and that really is an ancestor of the sort of um, shape library type approach that we have now. I, th I think the three people that are most responsible for why we're here today are Doug Trumbull, Bob Abel who did uh, really amazing commercials. Uh, Abel and Associates is right. pivotal. The, the, the butterfly girl for 7-Up. Well, the, uh, the, uh, the shiny robot, the robot woman, right? That's right. Just amazing. And woman. that was a little bit later, but, uh, and then, uh, of course, George Lucas. So these guys are all the ones that kind of came together in different ways to produce the industry that we have today. You know, a decade ago when, uh, when George was, was running a lot of his projects through the company is that, you know, I didn't really maybe fully appreciate how valuable it was that, uh, that George was pushing through these projects that uh, uh, were driving a lot of R&D. You know, George had uh, you know, sky high demands for uh, expectations of what we were gonna be able to accomplish and oh yeah, you guys will figure it out. And a lot of really wonderful advances came from George's attitude of now you guys will figure this out that benefited every other show that we did. The thing that really kind of flipped the switch was, and this was just before I started here, Jurassic Park came out. And I remember I, I was making, you know, business presentations at, at some company and I played hooky to go see Jurassic Park because I knew um, people here at ILM working on it. And, you know, I'll, they showed me some footage before it was out and I was like, oh, I got to see it. So I went there opening day, matinee, and I was just, I was blown away. 
I mean, just to see, you know, dinosaurs and, and they look believable. It was just like, okay, now I need to be a part of that. <laughs> I'm really proud of the Pirates of the Caribbean series that, you know, I was part of the um, Maelstrom development. That was a massive sequence, if you remember, on Pirates 3. Um, that, that was truly like a, a very difficult, you know, uh, to, to achieve. Uh, I was the uh, lead compositor at the time, sequence supervisor here on that sequence. That's one of my proud moments of uh, something I really um, enjoyed working on. That was really hard, very technical, but also that gave like this really interesting sequence. Um, in Iron Man 1, there was a suit up scene with, um, with, uh, where the silver suit sort of shows his stuff and struts his stuff. And that was one of the first times that we, that I remember specifically fooling the director with what was CG and what wasn't and having to explain it and then mistaking the CG for real and this sort of thing. That was immensely satisfying. The Tauntaun shot in Empire Strikes Back when George came in and said, look at this background, and it was this helicopter shot flying over Norway, it's supposed to be Hoth, and it sort of flies in and there's this big ice field and it sort of tilts down and looks down at the ice. And of course there's nothing there. And uh, he said, uh, do you think you could put a Tauntaun running across there with someone on it? And we were doing the Tauntaun stop motion and all. And, and I thought about it with all the camera moves and it's you know six axes of freedom and all this sort of stuff. And I said, no. There's just no way we could ever get it. It's going to be sliding around. And, and I tried something like this years before, working on Willy Wonka with my friend Jim Danforth with the flying Wonka Vader. We never got it. So why would this be any different than that? And uh, you know, he said, well, just think about it. Just think about it. Oh, OK, I'll think about it. And within 15 minutes, I'd figured it out. And if I had stopped thinking, you know, five seconds earlier in that process, I would have just said, well, there's just no way to do it, you know, but there was. So I learned from that to, that usually if you know the tool set well enough, there's, there's ways to rearrange things to give you images you haven't seen before, not just to do the same thing over and over again or do the same thing more efficiently or something like that. I'm really concerned about stuff new to your eyes that you haven't seen before. And that just opened up a whole lot of stuff so that by the time we got to Jedi, we could do with all the dogfight shots with explosions blowing up on the spaceships as the cameras flying by them. We could never have done that before. Part of the ILM ethos from you know, the very early days is, uh, is that uh, uh, the best projects, the, the projects ILM is most known for, are the ones where we weren't quite sure how we were going to do it going in. And you learn to trust in the process that uh, you break big problems down into smaller problems and you continue to, to, to do that until you've got problems that are, can be solved by an individual person. And uh, you learn that you know, we've got a lot of really smart and creative people at the company and if I can't solve the problem, somebody around me is going to rise to the occasion and we'll get through it, we'll figure it out. It's what we do and this process has never failed us yet. I always come at it from more from the, the story standpoint. The things that excite me are when I read something in a script and I think, wow, now that's going to be hard. I don't know how we're going to do that, but oh, that'd be really cool. And then that challenge of, right, we've got to figure out how we're going to approach this. Um, that's where you know, all the real innovation has come from, is reading a line in a script that, all right, we don't have any way of doing that now, but by solving that, it's going to be really cool. When I first joined um, ILM, we were going through our big expansion to do the prequels. And so we grew significantly at that time. And my job as one of the artist managers was to find the best artists in the world and bring them to ILM. So we've always been a very international company. Um, we hired a lot of people from the UK, a lot of people from Australia, a lot of people from all, all, around, uh, all around the world and brought them to San Rafael at the time and then um, um, moved to San Francisco when we moved there. So we've always been a melting pot of, of, of cultures and personalities and nationalities. Um, of most recent years, what we've done is gone to, brought ILM to the centers of the visual effects industry. So we set up in London, we set up in Vancouver, we set up in Singapore, um, which is a, a great center for um, uh, Asia. 
Um, and so in a lot of ways, it's still the same mix of the best talent around the world, but we've gone to the talent rather than um, bringing the talent um, and transporting the talent into, into America. One of the nice things about being at ILM right now is that uh, for the next uh, um, uh, series of years, we, we know some of our challenges and that well, we have one of the most complete yeah, production schedules coming out. in the world. Exactly, which is, a, which is a dream for a visual effects company to have a, a, at least part of their roadmap in front of them. So we already know some of the challenges with those, those movies and some of the creative opportunities with those movies, which are great because we can not only uh, plot out our production path, um, we can start, we can uh, um, plot out our technical development path as well. And so we're developing technologies now that aren't going to be in a movie until 2018. So um, that's a fantastic place to be for, for a visual effects company. And then we're also, I just find it a very exciting time in entertainment in general to be at the cusp of, the, of, of, of uh, new ways for people to experience this content. So um, we're very excited about the VR and AR space, immersive cinema, for, for what, certainly in the type of movies that we do, we're, we're helping directors create worlds. And those are worlds that, that audience, I know I do, I want to step into them. I want to go look around a little bit more and have, a, have a, a unique experience. And if I can have that experience with friends as well, so you can get to, you can um, talk about, you know, what you explored in those worlds, that, bring, that opens up a, a whole new, um, whole new path for us and a, and a whole new world for entertainment. One of the things I think is really wonderful about the company is how many people have been there for a really long time. And, you know, I've now been at the company a little over 29 years, and it's a home for me. And it's, uh, you know, I love the environment, I love the people. And that's true of, you know, people have been there for multiple decades. Um, you know, it has to be a pretty special place to, to engender that kind of loyalty. Star Trek Wrath of Khan, I got hired in 1981, August. My daughter was one month old when, uh, when I started working uh, at ILM. And here we are, 34 I, years. You shouldn't now. say how old, because that'll say how old your daughter is. <laughs> and she works here. She's a production manager becoming uh, an associate producer. Wow. So she, uh, she became uh, interested in the film business, and, and she's here, which is pretty crazy. That's incredible. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's My grandkids are downstairs. <laughs> I can go see them every day. What a wonderful thing it was that, you know, close to 30 years ago now, uh, that I got invited to join this, um, you know, this, this wonderful filmmaking community that George kind of single-handedly created in Northern California. He gathered these really wonderful, special, talented people and you know, I was so privileged to be invited to join that family. And, you know, I know it's a cliche, but, the, but really, these, uh, I love these people, and they have been as much a family as my real family. And my whole life has been different because of this great thing that George put together. Um, you know, it's, it's just been a, a real privilege to be part of that. Thank you, Mike. ILM truly is one of the great visual effects companies, and they continue to do incredible work. Now, over at FXPHD, we have just launched our July term, again with hundreds of courses to choose from. This term, we have a special focus on visual effects supervisors and the art of supervising on set.
Hi, and welcome to our new courses here at FX PhD. We're really keen to show you the new courses. Before we do, I want to just flag, of course, we've got a lot of courses coming back that are repeats and things that are available in the vault for immediate download. But here in our O-Week video, we like to run you through the new courses. And I want to explain some of the thinking behind how things have kind of evolved here at FX PhD. We've obviously been doing this for a while now. We've learned a lot. And what we've been doing is coming up, I guess, for the last 12 or six months with interlocking courses. So for example, in a moment, John's going to discuss our new VR course, which is a 200 level course that builds on the 100 level bootcamp of last term. That's all in VR. But the big thrust this term for us in new courses is going to be doing stuff in what we're calling feature films and TVC or commercials. Now, the reason that we're doing this is we're a little less concerned these days about 2D and 3D and more about offering not only courses that are 100, 200 or 300, but also courses that might be interlocking but kind of complementary. So for example, a matte painting that feeds into stuff to do with a modeling course that feeds into a texturing course that feeds into very, very high quality final shots. And we think that's a real important aspect of what we can do here at FX PhD, which is allow you to come up with materials absolutely at a sort of industry level and something you'd be really proud of to both have on your showreel and maybe use to take your career to the next level. So in a second, we'll cross to John and he'll discuss the new VR course, and then we'll get into this discussion over feature films and commercials. John will lead off with some of those feature film ones, and I'll see you in a moment. Well, thanks for that, Mike. And as you mentioned, we're really excited to have a new virtual reality course this term that builds upon our boot camp course that ran in the April term. Now, we've been talking to a lot of people who are producing VR right now, and one of the issues they have with artists is a lack of understanding of what VR is and kind of the basic standards and procedures of production as well as post-production. So we've got a lot of great people helping us out this term, including people like Scott Squires and Magnopus VFX supervisor Alex Henning. And what we're going to do is we're going to go out and shoot live-action spherical 360-degree monoscopic video. We're going to do it in a variety of ways so we can take a look at the various rigs and see what the pluses and minuses are. And then we're going to take that footage into post and basically correct it, add some effects elements, as well as do some green screen. And then we're going to do some audio as well as distribution. It's going to give you a really solid basis of understanding in the workflow, the building box. So if someone comes to you and asks you if you know how to do VR, the answer is yes. And again, this is just the first step in what we're doing regarding our v, uh, virtual reality curriculum at FXPHD. We've got a lot more planned in future terms, including tackling things like stereoscopic live action, as well as 3D. Now, as Mike mentioned, we've kind of got a real focus this term in kind of two groups of areas, and that's commercials as well as features. And I'm going to start with a look at some of our feature-related courses. The first course is the second part of our Tornado Destruction course, which is a really cool course covering taking a single scene, uh, adding a town, adding a tornado, and destroying it. And we also have a brand new course taking a look at digital map painting, basically building a desert apocalypse scene. Both of those courses were led by Ludovic Ayakem. Let's hear from him what he's got planned for those courses. Hey guys, last term we started to work on this plate and we proposed you to create a big tornado that we're supposed to go through a village. So on the first part, uh, the first term VFX 301, we focused on the tornado, we've done the FX, we've done the modeling, texturing on the village and uh, a main asset and we started to do the animation of everything. So that's the result that we have uh, at the end of VFX 301 and for VFX 302 we are going to keep working on this by um, doing some DMP for uh, the background, the village, uh, DMP for the sky, creating some clouds on different layers that we can merge with this tornado here and then pass everything to the comp. So VFX 302 is going to be a bit of look dev uh, lighting for everything here, a bit of DMP, village and sky and compositing for finishing the shots. guys. For this new DMP term, I propose you to work on this plate, which is quite nice because of the very big and long camera move that we have here. The idea is to uh, try to replicate an environment from Mad Max, so a lot of deserts, a lot of sand, uh, hot, and maybe trying to uh, add some cars and uh, trucks that could be buried in the sand and creating something a little bit post-apocalyptic like uh, we have in Mad Max that would be our reference for this term. We're going to have to start with the match move and then we are going to do a bit of modeling to have nice shapes and create some parallax. Then we're going to move everything in Nuke or Photoshop and we're going to start to paint the different projections that we're going to merge together in Nuke. So seeing this big camera move we're probably going to have 
um, different cameras. We can cover everything with one, so it's going to be a good example to see how to merge different um, projection together and how to texture a big environment and a big camera move like this with multiple cameras. Well, thanks, John. And building out from that, we have Liam coming back with a new explosion course. Uh, I'm going to let him run through that, but basically the idea here is, again, building out from what John was just saying about and being able to take that into a whole new world of uh, really hardcore <laughs> uh, destruction sequences. And we've got new assets for you that we've built specially for this course. Hi, and welcome to Explosion Simulations in Houdini. In this course, we're going to have a look at doing a pyrotechnic simulation inspired by the new Mad Max film. But instead of doing it with live action footage, we're actually going to do it in CG using live action reference photography of explosions and different pyro elements. We're going to create our own elements using particle systems and Houdini fluids. And we're also going to add in some particle effects in Maya. And then we're going to composite the whole thing together in Nuke. Um, there's going to be another separate course covering the lighting and the, um, the further comping of all these different elements together. And this course will focus 100% on simulating all the different elements um, to take this shot from beginning to um, the final setup ready for uh, rendering out all the different passes. We've got this fantastic um, Mad Max inspired uh, truck here that we can um, we'll be setting up for our rigid body dynamics explosions um, in the first week's class. Uh, all students will have access to that model and it'll just be a fantastic asset to, um, to animate uh, using expressions and keyframes and then to blow it up using rigid body dynamics, particles, um, instance debris. We've also got some fantastic background plate photography, uh, which we're going to use to stabilize and then track the vehicle into a, a number of shots. This is going to be part of the initial setup of this VFX sequence, uh, where we'll have 3D objects um, integrated into photo real backgrounds using, um, using the camera tracking. We'll also be covering um, an in-depth look at all the different pyrotechnics pyrotechnic effects um, platforms uh, in Houdini and Maya and also how to composite those together um, in Nuke. We're going to dive into all the different options that are in the node networks. This is a great course for anyone wanting to learn how to simulate explosions for a feature film VFX shot. Hope you enjoy the course. Also returning this term, two professors we're really glad to have back. Matt Leonard, who's doing a Look Dev course. And after that, we'll be looking at our new massive course. We've got Jeff Tobin, who is uh, one of the lead guys with Massive at Weta. He's done a ton of films, of course, all the Hobbit films, but, but his film credits are astounding. He's been with Massive since the days of Lord of the Rings. Uh, he's been there at Weta doing very, very hardcore feature film work, but He's coming in with a 100 level Massive course that allow you to take advantages of the new version of Massive and get this amazing ability to add production value. So this is a 100 level course from somebody that really could teach, I guess, a 500 level course. Thanks for that and welcome to our new Maya course, which is our next in the Maya Foundation series, this time covering look development and lighting. Over the next 10 weeks, we'll be using the core tools of Maya, RenderMan and Mental Ray as we look at both the artistic and technical aspects of look development and lighting. Firstly, colour theory, a key foundation for look development and lighting. We'll be exploring things like physically based rendering, scene referred and display referred imagery, gamma, gamut, ACES, open colour IO and how to work properly in a linear colour pipeline. Next, we'll move on to lighting itself, looking at the key concepts and stages, including how to read the lighting in a background plate and the use of grey and chrome on set spheres to help with the initial lighting setup. From there, we'll progress on to lighting the model, first using basic grey materials, and then the fully shaded asset that will light to match the background plate. From there, we'll look at high dynamic range images, a key lighting tool. First, we'll take a set of bracketed photos and convert these into multiple HDRIs. We'll stitch them together into a single lat long image and then color correct them using Nuke so they match the background plate, both in color and gamut. Finally, we'll extract the key light sources which we'll then use to light our scene. Next, we'll move to the concept and practice of look development. First, devoting an entire class to Maya's new revamped hypershader in Maya 2016. 
Next, we'll move across to our main project, which is looking at Digital Emily 2.1, which is being developed by the Digital Human League. Our goal will be to relook dev the project using RenderMan. From there, we'll look at cameras and lenses, covering the basics of photography and how f-stops, shutter speed and ISO affect the overall image. With our new knowledge, we'll move into the 3D realm and look at how we can use our digital cameras in a more physically plausible way. Finally, we'll move back into 2D and look at the creation of deep slap comps, first looking at the principles of deep image data, what should and shouldn't be done in slap comps, before finally outputting some deep data, both from RenderMan and Mental Ray, which can now be done using Maya 2016. This is going to be an excellent course for anyone who already knows Maya but wants to take their knowledge to the next level, or for someone just starting out. Hi, my name's Jeff Tobin, and I'll be teaching the Massive course for FX PhD this term. Massive is the crowd simulation software developed initially for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's since been used on many feature films, such as King Kong, Avatar, the new Planet of the Apes movies, and the Hobbit trilogy, to create realistic crowd scenes. Not only of people, but also cars, flocks of birds, stampeding horses, pretty much anything where you have a large group of entities interacting with each other and with the environment around them. So I'll be showing you the latest version of Massive, version 7. I'll introduce fundamental concepts like fuzzy logic and how that works within Massive. I'll show you how to create an agent, how to put together its AI brain to control the agent's behaviour, how to get it to sense other agents and the environment around it, and finally how to output the simulation for rendering. By the end of the term, we'll have created a simple traffic simulation, like you see here with cars driving on the street and traffic lights and pedestrians on the sidewalk. So I'm looking forward to showing you how to create crowd scenes using Massive, and I hope you are too. Well, to round out our feature film coverage, I want to talk about background fundamentals. Now, normally background is not specific to any one thing. It covers a range of things because it's a free course that we give you, obviously, as the name would imply, giving you the kind of background on stuff in the industry. But this term's very different. This term, we are looking solely at VFX supervisors, and we're going to sit down with some of the world's greatest VFX supervisors and discuss what it takes to be a good supervisor, how to get into the industry, how they got into the industry, and any advice they have for you. This is an amazing opportunity to learn for some of the greats. We did this once before and it was a huge hit. We haven't done it for about four or five years now, so we thought it was time again to go to the top VFX houses around the world and hear from the actual experts. Well, all of that brings us to the second half, which is our TVC hardcore effects work. And we want to look at commercials from beginning to end. Therefore, we're going to start with previs, because previs is a bit different in commercials than it is from feature film. And to do that, we've created our own entire kind of fake ad. And to get that really authentic, we've worked with experts from around the world to put together a comprehensive and professional brief that Matt Workman is going to take and do for us. Matt is actually new to FX PhD and a terrific addition to the team. Hi, my name is Matt Workman, and in this course, we'll be pre-visualizing a live-action Nike skateboarding commercial as a solo pre artist. We'll start off by creating 3D characters using Autodesk Character Generator and rigging them using the HIK system built into Maya. We'll finish up by giving him a skateboard and a hat and getting him ready for animation. We'll also be jumping into Photoshop to mess with this texture, and we'll be learning how to light using the real-time Viewport 2.0 system in Maya. Throughout the course, we'll be working with the sample director's treatment and agency storyboards. From these documents, we'll be able to figure out what the director's vision is, and we'll be able to incorporate that into our previs. We'll be breaking down each storyboard shot by shot and recreating those in Maya. We'll be doing some basic 3D character animation, but the real focus of this course is how to best represent a real-world camera inside Maya. The more you can understand about the live action production process, the better you'll be able to work with a live action director to help them visualize their commercial. We'll learn how to set up a native Maya camera to represent an Arri Alexa, and we'll be examining how real world cameras move using tripods, dollies, and techno cranes. By the end of the course, we'll have a finished animatic of the entire commercial that we're going to edit in Adobe Premiere, as well as a storyboard and corresponding technical diagrams that we'll lay out in Adobe InDesign. Previs and cinematography are both things that I'm really passionate about and I'm looking forward to sharing those with you in this course. Also joining us Tim, is Rob O'Neill, who's going to be looking at how to do visualization and stuff for commercials in Flame. Flame is something that we've obviously covered a lot, but we wanted to do is have a look at it in terms of doing actual sort of things that would come up maybe for TVC. Rob is incredibly experienced and we're really glad to have him joining us this term. Hi everyone, my name is Rob O'Neill. And I'm going to be hosting this term's class for flame artists 
if you want to know more about graphic design work in Flame. My intention with this course is that you'll be able to add to your already substantial skills with a solid understanding of the principles of good design. Over the coming weeks, we will be showing you the most effective use of shapes, color, typesetting, and even paint, especially for those that think they can't draw, all wrapped up in real-world examples within Flame. So stay with me over the next few weeks to increase your enjoyment of being a Flame artist, and please give me feedback on the forum so that we can make later lessons more interactive. Continuing on our look at commercial-based courses at FXPHD this term, I want to talk about our next course, which is an intermediate-level new course being taught by Eduardo Albon. Now, you may recognize Eduardo's name. He's the director of the Last Chick Project. It's a project we did at FXPHD several terms ago. And what this course is going to do is actually take a project that Eduardo did. He basically did half the shots himself, as well as farm those shots up off to experience new artists in Mexico City. And what he's going to do is actually recreate that workflow and show you how he did it in this course. So let's hear from him what he's got planned for this new new course. Welcome to Nuke 232. My name is Eduardo, and together we're going to break down a commercial I directed for the Mexican Postal Service and redo the visual effects. We'll be using Nuke Studio to conform the offline and together with a guest prof or two, work on the individual shots. Very much like how Spot Like This gets done at a small VFX boutique. We'll start off with a few of the easier shots, like adding logos that never made it onto boxes and removing an outdated URL, a telephone number, like an example on your right-hand side. We'll have a green and blue screen extractions, camera projections, and we'll finish up with a couple of set extensions that save the production more than a few shoot days. For final class, we'll review an online of the commercial made up of all member submissions. Looking forward to weeks ahead and see you in the forums. Well, I have a lot of experience with finishing TV commercials, but there's one guy who's forgotten more than I've ever learned. That's Jeff Huser. We're really excited to have Jeff back this term teaching a new course. It's one of our VFX Foundation courses, and this one is covering what it takes to do commercial finishing. Thanks, John. Well, my goal is to share my experience as someone who had a rare opportunity to be around at the birth of an industry. Um, so how you can use your experience and by me sharing mine to help you with problem solving, working whether you're working solo or as part of a team. Specifically, I want to talk about things like keying, conforming, marketing yourself, and a whole lot more we'll get into in a second here. So I've got a Flame 2016 here. I've got Hero, Nuke, Nuke Studio. Not really a course on any of those specifically. I'm just going to be using them to show you stuff for workflow uh, and to explain concepts and to work through projects. So I've got some special guests lined up too to help me in the goal of helping you become a great finishing visual effects artist. So to recap, here's some of the areas that I'd like to cover. I want to talk a lot about bidding a job with a special guest, the producers coming in to join us. Uh, I want to talk about doing tests with him as well. Um, and then on set behavior, what, what do you do on the shoot and how do you walk onto the set and become accepted as part of the crew, which is very important, as well as the tools you might need to take with you. I want to spend some time on conforming plates, a very important part of the job now as teams have expanded, getting the plates online for the team to access efficiently. Um, also the conforming finish, the finish with the clients in the room, doing final color correction, tweaks, last looks, the kind of things that come up in the last final moments as they're trying to deliver the job, even legals um, and time management. Those are things I really stress uh, and we'll talk a lot about that. And like I mentioned, keen, we'll talk tracking, and we're going to spend some time on demo reels too. Very important part. People often don't like to do them, but a very important part of the job. So selling yourself, marketing yourself with an overall theme of problem solving. So I hope you'll join me for this course. Several terms ago, we had a killer introduction to 3D Equalizer course that was taught by Philomatic. And he's back for our July term to teach a new intermediate level course in which he shares his tricks of the trade that he's learned on the job over the years. Hi everyone, my name is Philip Maddock and welcome to this FX PhD 200 course in using 3D Equalizer 4. In this course, we're going to be talking about some of my favorite tips and tricks that are really going to improve productivity and speed inside of 3D Equalizer. We're going to be taking a look at some things like object tracking using multiple reference frames and also diving into some of the more advanced camera constraints, circle constraints and line and nodal constraints. We're also going to be diving into some of the more advanced aspects of the 3D Equalizer 3D environment. 
we're going to be utilizing some Python tools to average points to create screen replacements when no markers were used. This is one of my favorite tips and tricks, and uh, this script is something you can take into your own workflows. We'll be looking into building up dense point clouds by utilizing frames in the timeline to build up reference cameras to reinforce our solves. Also taking a look at how to estimate lens distortion using the tools right here inside of 3DE. Now this is a really powerful technique and essential skill to learn. We'll also be taking a look at shots that are almost impossible to solve using conventional techniques such as this one where we reverse a zoom camera to create a dolly track. We'll also be talking about practical ways to render really impressive dailies and how to save out these dailies renders for review by your supervisor. Now I hope you'll come along with me on this FX PhD 200 course. Now, it's going to be a great course full of lots of handy tips and tricks you can take with you into your day-to-day -day workflow. Well, that's it for a look at the new courses running at FXPHE this term. But as Mike mentioned in the open, we have a fantastic lineup of killer returning courses. Just because they're not new doesn't mean they're not great and of fantastic value for you. Be sure to check them all out. There are over 100 courses on offer this term at FXPHD. You can see them all at fxphd.com slash courses. Before we close out, I just want to mention another fantastic benefit of FXPHD, and that's our VPN software. Basically what happens is you create a secure connection between your computer and our server and it allows you to license the full applications of things like Nuke so you can follow along with the courses, create shots, save your setups, and build them for your reel. It's really a fantastic benefit of being a member of FXPHD and a lot of people take advantage of it. Well, that's it for this O-Week video. Before we close out, just want to thank the guys working behind the scenes, and that's Jimmy, David, and Ryan. Basically, they help with this video and basically keep things running on the site throughout the term, supporting our members. We're really excited about this term, a fantastic lineup, including our VR course, which is just the first of many that we have building into the future. But for now, uh, that's it for Mike and I. We hope to see you in the forums. See ya. Thanks, guys. Oh, and don't forget that ILM will be presenting at SIGGRAPH this year, and we'll be there too. Until then, see ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts, and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.